afternoon. Um, welcome to, to BCS. Uh, welcome to this uh, special webinar about the, the power of positive gaming. Um, my name is Martin Cooper. I'm uh, an editor, a writer on um, IT Now, which is uh, BCS's uh, member magazine. And I think, full disclosure, um, this is going to be, uh, this isn't going to be a conversation about whether games are a force for good or a, a force for bad. I think I think we're, we're, we can all agree we're kind of a partisan panel, really. Um, we're, I think we're all gamers, and I think we can all agree that game, games are great. The sequel for this, this, this conversation, uh, the genesis of, of this idea was the, the recent story about um, Chinese, China's uh, mooted um, gaming ban, and BTS um, published, a, a, the charity published a release about really how harmful that taking out such a position would be. But as we kind of scoped out this, this conversation, we came to realise that the debate about games, I suppose, alleged toxicity is, is sort of a really well rehearsed one. Um, and we, we came to realize, I think, as, as a group, as a team, that we'd like to start from an assumption of, of positivity and, and explore that, that, that positivity. We'd like to talk about um, how we can get the best from games and how we can help our kids get the best from games. And I think that'll be the fascinating and useful part of, of, of this chat. As a parent, you know, I watch my kids play games. I even try to sort of play along with them. But I often come away with this idea that I'm a stranger in, in, in strange lands. Um, but enough about me. We can, I think we should start by asking our panel of experts to, to introduce themselves. So in no particular order, Neil, maybe do you want to kick us off? Yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks for inviting me today. I'm Neil Rickus. I'm a senior lecturer in computing education at the University of Hertfordshire. Also wear lots of other hats. I'm an education specialist at the BCS. I work at UCL and do lots of independent writing as well. And um, Andy? Yeah, I'm a journalist uh, with about 15 years focusing on families and video games. Uh, I run the Ask About Games website um, for UK, um, which is kind of a place that parents can go to sort of find out about the nuts and bolts of how to how to play games safely and positively. And I've recently written a book for parents called Taming Gaming, which is sort of a similar territory, but kind of has some actual suggestions of games that parents could play themselves and also play with their children. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Shanila? Hi, um, so I'm head of education for Yuki, and uh, in a previous life before I joined Yuki, I was a computing teacher um, and led a computer science department. Uh, and now I sort of oversee um, the education work that Yuki does. Um, part of that is running Digital Schoolhouse. Um, I've also authored a couple of books all around kind of playful learning and how to teach computing in kind of creative, playful ways. Thank you very much. And please, if this is an interactive session, so if there are any questions, please add them to the um, to the, the, the chat feature in, in, in Zoom. But really, to, to start us off, I'm kind of quite interested in the idea that possibly that you know the, pop the popularity of big first-person shooters has come to kind of dominate what games mean. You know, it's action, it's guns, it's explosions, it's kind of you know it's violence. I mean, I'm kind of interested in the idea that games, gaming, is an incredibly diverse universe. There are so many different types of games. So many different genres, Minecraft. I have to read this from my list. Um, untitled uh, Goose Game, Stardew Valley, Harvest Moon, Goat Simulator, FIFA, Animal Crossing. So many different types of games. So many different types of people play them for so many different reasons. And maybe Andy, you'd like to kick us off just to talk about the sort of the diversity that exists in gaming. Yeah, I think it's quite helpful to frame it like that because it's easy to think, oh, games are mainly played by boys and maybe played by teenagers in their bedroom and so the games are just focused on that which the actual statistics you know the average gamer is getting into a mid 30s I think last time I looked it's probably even older and it's pretty even split um in terms of gender um and so the games reflect that that there really is a game about anything um uh, but sort of finding finding those experiences is about kind of thinking well, what do I want to play how do I want to play and then looking for those games and some of the ones you mentioned you know are really good ways of kind of opening up that conversation so the like untitled goose game you play this kind of cantankerous goose going around a, a tranquil English village causing chaos and kind of playing the bad guy but in a in a way that is very different to you know playing again like Fortnite where you're shooting people or maybe you're running a farm in Stardew Valley or um or what getting to know your inhabitants in Animal Crossing and designing your own kind of island. So even in those quite mainstream examples, um, there's already a, a wide variety of things to do. Um, and also how you play them, or what you get out of them will be very different. So we start to move towards seeing games, not just as entertainment, but entertainment, but also kind of a media that's really well fit for our kind of our age, that does things similar to books and films and music and theatre, um, but in its own way. And I think that's quite a helpful way to frame things as we get started here. 
Cool, thanks. And um, Neil and Shanil, your, your, your views on, on, on the sort of the diversity, the richness, the, the, the benefits. Yeah, th thank you. So it, I think this term of what it means to be a gamer, as Andy said, it, it might not be a uh, perhaps the way the media portrays what a gamer looks like. It could be a, a granny playing Candy Crush on the bus. And actually, they're gaming and they're, they're probably having an, an enjoyable experience there. And also, I think for young children, even some of the mainstream titles we mentioned already, actually their experience of gaming perhaps is a, a very simple game on a tablet device they might have at home. And that perhaps enables them to experiment with technology, uh, perhaps fail safely, um, as it were, and really enjoy their interaction with technology rather than perhaps having to, to blow off a bad guy's head, for example. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I uh, completely agree. And I think, you know, as, as Andy and Neil have said, you know, almost half the population plays games and there's about 900,000 different games available across all platforms to download. So there's a huge variety and we're, we're never going to be able to list all the titles, but um, there is such variety in them, you know, along the ones that we will mention. I think the one, one of the games that sort of stands out is uh, that became very popular a while back is Among Us. Um, I, I see that quite as a as a hybrid game, and and um, for people that don't know Among Us, um, I would definitely try it out. But um, it's essentially, and Andy and Neil, correct me if I'm going to describe this incorrectly, laid. <laughs> it's, but it's essentially a, a team of players working together. Um, and uh, amongst them is uh, this imposter. The role of the imposter is to stab sabotage the work and murder all the crewmates. And the role of the crew is to work out who the imposter is and complete the tasks. It's, it's great as a game because you can play it. Some people play it both online, but it's been a great one to play uh, while you've been on video call or something at the same time. So we've played it as a Yuki team, um, you know, when we've all been working remotely in lockdown, but we've also played it at home. So it's been great sort of seeing something like that from an educator's perspective, as well as a parent, you know, in, in games like that, helping us to connect with families that we've not been able to see, but in a really fun way. And, you know, the debate and persuasion and questioning skills that it starts to develop amongst children is is quite fantastic and at the other end of the scale you've got things like um games like assassin's creed which the traditional assassin's creed you know associated with you know a, a fair degree of violence but they they um have released their discovery tour versions of assassin's creed which are minus all of that violence and actually um specifically designed for educational purposes these are interactive immersive worlds where children can learn about historical worlds and uh, as well as you know not just history but you know the scientific elements and going back and and all of these different things into including literacy so there's there's huge stuff actually and there's more and more games coming out now which um these sort of big names and big titles that um are I guess unashamedly saying there is educational value to this game and you know there is you know this is a game that is fun, but it's also a game with a purpose. So th th I think there's more of those happening now. Cool, fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of quite interested in the, almost the kind of the unintended benefits of gaming. You know, mm -hmm. you know how how are games kind of helping kid or preparing kids for for um for for, for the digital world for, for the world of work. You know, it, fa it fascinates me. I, you know, I watch my kids play games, and my my daughter's playing, I think, um, Stardew Valley or something of that nature. But she's talking to a mate on an iPad as well. And you know, I kind of think of you know the world of work, this idea of digital transformation, the pandemic, sending everybody home. How difficult it was for businesses to 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 empower, and make people feel confident to to work in a distributed way, to work to solve problems uh, across the internet, to work as you know distributed teams. You know, even the ideas of kind of digital currency, all these things are kind of embedded in in games. So, how do you feel that kind of gaming is preparing people for your young people for tomorrow? Okay. I think one of the what I like about games is how layered they are. That um, you might think, you know, a child just playing something like Fortnite, you know, pretty straightforward game, but they they look like they're just pressing pressing buttons, and it looks like oh, you're good at that game, or you're not good at it because of your reactions. But what's actually happening is a really layered experience. They're sort of dealing with lots of systems on lots of levels, much like we would do in a job. And actually they're working quite hard to get that kind of enjoyment out of it. So they're dealing with like the geography of the world, where they need to go, the, the physics of how far they can jump. Then you've got the other players in the space. 
How are they responding? How are they equipped in terms of their weapons? Should they go towards them? And then they've got their teammates they need to talk to and coordinate. So you know, that's one example of a game that looks relatively simple, um, but actually offers this kind of very nuanced experience that is quite similar to the sorts of things we need to deal with when we're, de when we're working in teams and when we're trying to achieve quite complex things with different systems coming in. So a child who's used to that in Fortnite, they probably don't realize it, and maybe their parents don't either, but actually they're pretty well equipped to deal with some of those things. And I think when they're in offices in later life, they may well think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I can kind of cope with this. This reminds me of when I was in a team and trying to work out how to capture the flag or whatever in, in the game that they were playing. So uncovering some of that's quite exciting because, because it's kind of a bit hidden. Cool. And Sorry, Neil, I picked up your, your, you talked about sort of fail fast and fail often. And uh, that, that might maybe the games that kind of kind of invest kids with an idea of sort of tenacity, I guess, or? Yeah, certainly. And linked to that, there's lots of uh, times when they've got to solve those problems, such as uh, Andy mentioned, but also uh, for, for younger children, perhaps how the interface works and perhaps that I, I need to start this thing and I need to use my phone fine motor skills to actually navigate around this game. All those kind of skills um, are really important for children to be able to access digital technology and use these devices effectively. We, we often um, hear the term digital native that children just come out the womb and they can use this stuff. Or, and there's certainly, uh, if you've tried to perhaps uh, teach year one how to log on uh, for example actually that those kind of skills need to be explicitly taught and by playing a lot of these games they are um, getting their hands dirty with this stuff and actually having a, a really positive um, experience with their devices and and Shanila what's, what's 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 your view on the kind of the unintended benefits I, I mean, there, there is so much. I mean, there is uh, certainly that element of digital savviness that they, they develop and, you know, that comfortability to use multiple different platforms at the same time. You know, they'll be, um, they'll, you know, they'll be on a video call with their friends or, or, you know, and playing a game at the same time and there'll be something else happening and, you know, there'll, there'll be three or four different things going on at the same time, this kind of multitasking ability. And, and as, as we are increasingly working in a digital world and, you know, every, I guess, you know, every single one of our devices at the moment probably has multiple windows open in the background. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a skill that we, we do need and, and it's a skill that they're getting. But, you know, all games involve an element of strategic thinking and problem solving. And those are key 21st century skills, uh, you know. And, you know, if you think, you know, sort of simple games, you know, historically, um, uh, you know, looking at solving puzzles and challenges, you know, that involve an element of logical reasoning and logical reasoning, again, is another key thinking skill that we that we do need, um, you know, to to develop and look through. But, you know, games that have um, involved communication or working in a team, again, there's team working and communication. And again, these are really key soft skills and they're great for, um, you know, one of the impacts of, of lockdown that we've all seen is, um, of course, we've talked about isolation and the impact on us, but children who are in their development, you know, my daughters are in year six and the last normal school year they had was year three. That's a huge amount of time. And in terms of children's cognitive development, that is phenomenal. If a, lot, a lot of that time has been spent at home with me, poor things. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, so there's an element there of teaching where almost you know, we do need to focus on, yes, of course, you know, the gov you know, the governments have talked about focusing on maths and English, and, and I guess rightly so, but there is an element where we do need to actually focus on those social skills and and that and those communication skills and that sort of collaborative working. And and I think games are bridge um school life and personal life for children really, really well. So they can they can help do that for us. Mm -hmm. What I found that's really interesting. What I what I found fascinating at the, at the beginning of I think the very first lockdown when we were all sent home. How my uh, son particularly used the PlayStation and the headphones and the headset. That they'd, um, you know, work classes would be done via Zoom and Teams, and then at playtime they'd all go and find the PlayStation and have their kind of game time and chat with each other. It was more really talking and chatting through the medium of the game, and then playtime would end and they go back to lessons. And they'd, you know, as you said, the the the, the PlayStation the PlayStation Network formed that kind of cohesion, that bridge, kept those relationships alive. But moving on, um, and a BCS, a CAS, and Barefoot Network, uh, we've a sort of long heritage of, of helping uh, to embed and grow computing in schools. And I'm really interested in learning more about 
this link between gaming and and inspiring people into into STEM subjects. You know, on one hand, I kind of look at games sometimes and I think they're so big and grand and cinematic that kids might just consume them and not really feel that it's participating in in that kind of career is 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 achievable. I mean, what's your what's your feeling on that? That kind of linkage between gaming and inspiring people into STEM. I think I think I think there's I think there's a huge link in what, in what you said. You know, this idea of sort of children sometimes consuming a game and and not necessarily realizing, um, you know, what what they've learned. I I think that's a that's something that children can do. It's something we we can all do. I think you know if we think about, um, you know, the the English homework and the reading that you know the the guidance that comes from the primary schools about you know reading with your children, um, it's never just you know, it's your teacher, the teachers never just say, just read a book and that's enough. Um, you know, they say, talk to your child about what you've read, ask them some questions and, and they will give you, uh, some teachers in schools will then give you example discussion questions. And the idea there is that, you know, you are, you've read the book, you've enjoyed the story and now you're diving deeper to make sure that the child has really understood. And it's tapping into that knowledge and raising it to that conscious level and uh, enabling students to get a deeper uh, understanding of that topic. The same applies to video games, actually. And um, parents can have the same role to play and as do teachers. And I think when you use games in the classroom, the great thing about teachers is that teachers can provide a, you know, that structure and the scaffolding within how that lesson is delivered that allows that experience in the gameplay, but actually stops at the right times, brings discussion in at the right times and uses the activity in the right ways to really help, to really help deepen that understanding. I know in sort of digital schoolhouse, this is something we've tried to do in lots of different ways. And whether it's using the games and the techniques or whether it's even teach how te teaching how industry actually makes games so lifting the lid on that and actually going behind the scenes because there's two sides to video games i think there is the use of the video game itself and then there is the deconstruction of the game and understanding how that game is made and going behind the scenes with that and there is a lot not just of computer science but of mathematical thinking and and, and art and design and music you know that can go under this and there is a lot of valuable learning you know games are a beautiful hotbed of STEM subjects or STEAM subjects rather and they fuse them in a way that few other resources I think can and then I think with the with the right type of lesson plans you can really get a lot of kind of deep understanding um, through that as well as in contextualizing that learning within the subject you know sometimes kids don't always see what they're learning in the classroom as come wholly relevant to their use of technology outside of school and when you are able to contextualize that you know their classroom experience within something like the games industry it really helps them go, children understand and go behind the scenes of what's happening behind the screen and it provides that connection with them whether that's through things I mean we do things like the esports tournament but as well so whether it's through things like you know esports tournaments or lesson plans or whatever I think there's lots of there's lots of things there there's lots of different ways to do it. Fascinating cool I mean I, I remember as a kid that spending a lot of time playing games on my spectrum and then trying to kind of, as you, I really like your idea of deconstructing and then trying to kind of recreate that myself. Well, that, that, that kind of really resonates with me. Neil, I can see you smiling away there. Yeah, that, it was really nice to hear the digital schoolhouse resources explained and quite a lot of the stuff we've recently done with Barefoot where we've developed games perhaps to teach children about phishing scams, for example, or different ways that children can protect themselves uh, uh, by improving their understanding of cyber security we've made sure yes there's the game there but actually here's a lesson to unpick it but also here's someone who actually does this stuff as a job as well and they're actually talking there um, about how what they do how that relates to the game and we've tried to bring in people from a wide range of background from a variety of roles um, as well um, also just got my notes here there, there is research out there that outlines how Actually, experiences related to gaming and computer science can help drive people towards further study in computer science as well, uh, which is uh, quite interesting uh, to see as well. So that there is is that link there in certain cases. Fantastic. Um, so thanks. Brilliant stuff. So I'm wondering this idea that you know that the games are kind of sometimes seen as as as, as bad and almost maybe parent worry that maybe parents see them as a kind of waste of time for kids. So I'm wondering. What can lead parents to kind of misunderstand or mis uh, misinterpret games? I mean, I'm kind of interested in, in the idea, and you guys probably know more than I do, but, the, you know, the PlayStation came out, I think, in 1995. So a lot of 
parents, you know, parents of young children would have had PlayStation. So why, why, why? Maybe Andy, you can lead us on this one. Why do you think maybe parents misunderstand gaming or kind of don't see it within this this positive context that we've talked about? Because it does, it does. It's a good point. <clears throat> it does feel like, you know, most people who have got children now will have, their games will have been part of their childhood or around their childhood. Um, but I think it's just it's a sign of how you know games are still kind of just getting started in terms of a media. We're still getting to know them. They're still improving and changing rapidly, and so that means that um, that the games that children play now are probably quite different to the games we used to play when we were children. And you can have actually even in more in that particular scenario. Sometimes it's like, well, this isn't the sort of game I like to play, so I'll just let my kids play it, rather than seeing games as kind of a media, like we were talking about earlier, that where a child actually needs that guidance. So. We get this kind of separation between a parent and video games and also the parent and the, and the child. And a lot of the work that I do on Ask About Games and other resources is trying to help parents regain that confidence and that literacy about games at a, a kind of a deeper level so that they can get ahead of their children. And actually that even that phrase, you know, lots of parents will say I could never get ahead of my kids with games. They just they own it all the time. But the, the reality is and my experience of talking to parents is that with, with not too much work, you can actually, particularly younger, get a bit ahead of them and actually guide them into some games that they then love. And you really, then you have this equity in the gaming space of the life of your child and they will come to you and you'll, you'll talk about it much more rather than it, it being something where they kind of know, oh, mum, dad doesn't doesn't play games and so they won't know about it. I sometimes compare it to like eating vegetables. You know, we all want our kids to eat vegetables. But if our kids never saw us eating vegetables, you know, they're savvy. They'd be like, I'm not eating these. You don't eat these. You know, so if if we don't play games ourselves in a way that's kind of a rooted part of, of, of the media we enjoy in our lives, kids know that. And it means that we don't necessarily have that the sort of authority or understanding to kind of give that their guidance. So I think that's that's where it comes from. But I think the good news is it's not hard to turn that corner, particularly when kids are younger. They really love it when we get involved and they they light up when they get you to ask your child, what are you playing or how are you doing? Or these open questions that get them talking. And they're like, oh, great. Oh, we're going to talk about this, are we? And they're off. And so... It's a, it's a lovely thing to help parents do that. And I, I, you know, it's, it's why I continue to do it because of those little moments where a parent's like, oh, you know, I've got my kids back. I hadn't realised this. This is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Shanil, I can see you. I can see you. Uh... No, I was just thinking from, from what Andy said, I think, I think my, uh, my daughter tutored me through Animal Crossing and she still does. Um, <laughs> she feels like she does it. But I, I think sometimes, you know, the, the, I think there's, there's a couple of things here. I, I think, you know, as, as Andy said, you know, I, I hear this all the time, you know, you know, people of our generation, you know, were, were mostly all kind of game players in their thing. And I, video games sort of back then going going back 30 years, 40 years, whatever, you know, it was quite an expensive hobby, to be honest. You know, like to be completely frank, and and actually, it's still not. Um, you know, if you're buying, if you're looking at the like, price of consoles, and uh, you know, a, a new game coming out can be, you know, upwards of forty pounds or something like that. You know, if you're if you're from a low income family, or, or if you were from a, as a parent now, you were from a low income family when you were back then. Chances are, you didn't have a games console in your bedroom, so you didn't have that engagement as a child yourself, and you're not, you know, so therefore you're starting out from a from a later later position video games do permeate every aspect you know it's, it's I'm not I'm not saying that people have not you know experienced this world or anything like that you never had it at school or anything like that but I'm just saying you know there is that you know not everybody had it in their bedroom is the point I'm making um we have all connected with the medium at some point but we do as parents feel and this is and coming back to Andy's point you know as parents we feel that we need to be two steps ahead and for that we there's an element of learning we need to do before we engage with our children teachers feel the same way so I, I, when Raspberry Pis first came out, I had them in the classroom and they were sitting there for a good three months before I actually thought of taking it in front of the kids. And that's because I felt like I needed to use, learn how to use the Raspberry Pi myself before I could teach a bunch of kids with it. And I realized actually, if I do that, I might never actually take it to the children because I don't have the time to, to do all these types of things because I've got to write, you know, 200 year nine reports or something. But, um, you know, so it was actually, why not learn with the children? And that was such a powerful experience in terms of, you know, the the motivation and the ownership and the dynamics that creates. And as parents, we can do the same thing. We don't have to always feel like we've done four hours worth of research and homework before we actually sit down in front of the children with the children. We can just sit down with the children. And as Andy said, just ask them, just just try and play the game with them. 
you know, my daughter loves, I, I let my daughter believe that, you know, she, she knows all more about this stuff than I do sometimes because it's quite empowering for her. And actually it's really valuable for me to get her to explain it to me. And we know the educators amongst us will know there's huge value when you get children to explain things and, you know, in, in terms of not just their communication and also the, the sorts of those types of things. So I, th I think there is that. I think, I think that in itself can be a blocker. And if you don't understand that world, you it's easy to then um, take, you know, those high, higher profile negative stories as blanket statements that apply to the entire medium, which is not the case. But you're largely seeing that because you you're not as aware of the world or you're not as aware of that. You know, we talked about earlier in this conversation, the diversity of games. And if you're not aware of the sheer spread and diversity of games and you've not engaging with that medium at all, it's very easy for you to buy into some of these stereotypes. The only way to get around it is to sit down with your kids and have a conversation. It's a really interesting idea, actually, to be led by the kids. And I, I think I feel have, I think, fallen foul of that idea of I have to be an expert before, before I can do anything with my children. And that's a really interesting idea. What I find interesting, actually found interesting was a conversation I had with my son about, Dad, what were games like when you were younger? You know, we were playing Minecraft together. You know, did he, did he used to play online with your mates? Well, no, we hadn't got the internet then. You know, we used to go around to each other's houses and, and, and play together, which was, you know, and it's, it's, just running that experiment in, in reverse, I found quite fascinating about, you know, how kids, today's kids react to yesterday's, yesterday's games. But Neil, I mean, is there anything you'd like to add, add, add there? Um, yes, a couple of bits. The... Perhaps the portrayal in the media of what gaming is is perhaps outdated, maybe hasn't moved on from the early 90s when we were uh, up in arms about Mortal Kombat and those kind of uh, games, uh, for example, that they are you know, perhaps very linear, um, only about beating each other up, as it were. And there's certainly, you know, that's where the good games, as it were, maybe aren't written about because they don't make good newspaper headlines um, as well a lot of the time. Um, but also... I think some maybe some will come on to in a bit is that a lot of games perhaps now really help children address some of the things they might be going through in their lives. Uh, for example, a lot of games will now look at issues around mental health, for example, and perhaps because you can explore those kind of things in a game makes it uh, a much more positive thing for people. Yeah, I mean, Andy, was it was it? Um, I don't know when we talked, was it Stardew Valley or, or Harvest Moon? That, that idea of kind of mindfulness in games, I found really interesting when we talked. Yeah, there's a whole kind of raft of games and really, you know, what, what you find mindful is different person to person. So, you know, different games will work, but some games have kind of woven into them kind of moments to stop and reflect. So games which you play on a cycle, like Stardew Valley or a farming game, you'll have moments where the day is over and you sort of, you've done your work and so it's now it's time to stop and it can kind of teach you a nice kind of way that you don't always need to be chasing and chasing. And then there are other games that the, the actual experience itself of the game is quite calming and, and actually helps children or people of any age kind of get into quite a sort of meditative, calm state where they can, come, they can come back to themselves and they can reflect on the day and they can do some of that work that actually is quite, quite helpful but quite complex and hard to do, but the game can create this context where it just naturally takes you in that direction. There's a game, Abzu, that I quite like playing in the evenings and you could have exploring this underwater world. It's a very light narrative. It's very simple to play. And that, that just is a great way for me to just to sort of take a pause before once I finish work then going into the evening. And so I think lots of people can find those games. But again, it is helping sort of understand that the breadth of games on offer so that you can try quite a few and then gravitate towards the ones that work for you. And also, you know, you know, your children. So what sort of experience would work for our children? And we know we know how to do that with books and how to, and how to do that with films. And so helping parents to do that with video games is, is, is really exciting because it's really, it's quite a powerful thing to do. Um, but it's something which I think we're doing more and more. And I think I'm keen to sort of see it, see it in that light. And so this conversation is really exciting. Cool. I mean, I think confidence, I guess confidence is, is a great thing. And I'm not really thinking about kind of giving confidence within games and, you know, that, that sort of dexterity, but actually how do we as parents de develop that kind of conversational uh, confidence. I mean, I like Shanili, your your talk, your your point about the, the importance of the, these conversations. So, how do we start to build that confidence our, ourselves? I think sometimes just sort of sitting down, and and actually the first step uh, can be sitting down and actually just joining in uh, a game with your kid and say, can 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 I can I play? 
kids love it when we go up to them and play with them. And actually, um, so uh, Yuki, um, we we did the Get Smart About Play campaign, um, which which is sort of running out there, and that's got four steps in it. Um, with the first one saying play with your children and uh, while you're playing we know when you when you play a game that opens up conversation naturally it doesn't matter who two people are playing together you will start talking and you will inevitably start talking about the game and when you've got a parent and child talking about what they're playing that is a great that's the first that's the door opening right there and it's just ready for you to walk through um and then actually the next the next couple of things on there are um, then if you did want to sort of go further, learn about the family controls, almost, you know, all consoles um, have some kind of parental restrictions and family control settings, all sorts of games do, you know, we maybe are not aware of them, the ask about games, Andy will be able to talk about this in more detail. Um, this is his bag, but you know, uh, great, great resource there. Um, and then, you know, all sorts of those things. And then that leads into things like talking to your children about, you know, the ground rules and restrictions and parents can remember, it's okay to say no. Parents are in charge. No we're, <laughs> no, we're not. Sorry. I was going to say about something uh, linked to what she was saying was that actually about if the device can be in a communal area as well so um, it maybe just becomes part of the general things you're talking about you're walking past oh i can see you uh finally uh defeated that mini game or mario party or whatever it is they're playing at that point and it maybe doesn't have to be a, a very distinct moment all the time i'm going to sit down with my child and we are going to talk about games mm. actually it, it could be just be an occasional thing um as well but i think uh, getting involved uh, having a go and also um, as, as well as perhaps those ground rules uh, Shanina mentioned that you can very quickly uh, then see perhaps if there is something that makes your child feel uncomfortable or perhaps there is something that pops up on the screen that uh, you need to assist with and it makes those kind of conversations easier as well. I think I've been too Edwardian as a parent in, in retrospect. My kids are <laughs> heading towards their, 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 their late teens now. But Andy, that, that, that confidence then, how was the key to building it? Is it really just a matter of sitting down talking? Yeah, well, so I mean, I think I always want to start by saying, you know, games kind of come at us as parents and we're busy and there's lots of stuff happening and it can be a bit overwhelming. So the realisation that actually we can take back control with some very simple steps can help us get the breathing space as kind of not necessarily as a long term solution, but to kind of say, OK, how do I want to approach this? How does this match up with how I'm parenting in other areas? And so when I ask about games, we have some really simple guides that help you set up the console or the smartphone or the PC so that you can say, sit down with a child and sort of say, well, how long, should, how long should you play each day? And that can sound like a bit of a funny question. Like, won't children just say all day? But my experience and the, the experiences that parents report is actually children are, are usually quite realistic. I want to do some other stuff. So maybe a couple of hours or an hour, depending on if it's the weekend. And then you can set that up on the console so that it's not you as the parent kind of coming in and, and policing them. But it, you know, it's, it's you, it's the child basically understanding, oh, this is a limit and this is so that I can do something else. Um, and then so that together you can do that in other areas as well. So again, on Ask About Games, it talks about how to limit spending so that a child doesn't make an unexpected purchase. Because often we, you know, we sign up to stuff, we hand the child the, the tablet and then they might buy something um, unexpectedly. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't log them into Amazon and be like, oh, have a look around. We wouldn't be surprised if they then made a purchase, but sometimes we can do that with video games. So understanding that, oh yeah, games have a commerce side to them, and it's very simple to set to specify how and when they play, and to give them some pocket money, um, and that becomes then quite a positive part of that conversation. So having that in an open way means that if something untoward does happen or something that just makes them feel uncomfortable, they're then going to come and tell you rather than thinking, oh, I better not tell mum and dad or I might lose my game. And so you've got this really open conversation, like Neil was saying, having the, the, the console in the family space is a great way because it makes it, it takes away some of that pressure and you just overhear what's happening at meal times. Then you're like, oh, how's your game? Or I saw you do this or what was that like? And, and the conversation becomes really different. But that just, just knowing that, oh, we can have control when we need it, I think is a really important thing. That's, that's, it's important not to gloss over. Fantastic, thanks. So maybe we can draw this to a to, to a summary. I'm just I really like that that idea that 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 term. I think you coined Andy positive gaming. So as parents, what's the key to helping our kids get the best from gaming? I mean, maybe we could just move across the panel with one kind of pithy piece of advice. Shanila, what's your summary? Um, I guess my summary is um, I think sometimes generally we we can see uh 
being playful as a hindrance and an obstacle to learning. Um, and it's not. And our children play all the time. And um, let's work with that. And that applies just as much to the classroom as it as it does to home. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there because there's a lot there, but you, we asked for a small summary and that's it. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Andy, Andy, what's, what's, what's your summary? What's your key takeaway? I think the most powerful thing you can do if you've got a child who loves video games is to find games that you love yourself. And that's a challenge to do, but it's, it's really worth the effort because suddenly you become this insider and it opens the door to a very different perspective on games. And what's the best, I mean, from a, from a parents, what's the best way we can, we can go and find out about, about games? Yes, yeah, so some resources, Ask About Games is a great place to go. Um, my book, Taming Gaming, the second half of the book is just loads of recipes, so laid out just intentionally trying to help parents find it. And I also run a big database of video games, the family video game database that, that sort of helps you discover lots of games. It's got lots of, a bit like Netflix, it's got lots of unusual lists of different games for education or for travel or adventure or, you know, or what, lots of, or, you know, positive mental health, lots of areas. So those are good places to go. Um, but the, the thing is just to, to have a go, you know, to, don't, don't feel like you can't. Uh, and everybody starts from that, that position. And that's okay, it's a completely fine place to say, I can't play games, too many buttons. There are, there are loads of games, particularly on the database that are, are designed for, for parents who start from that position, which is absolutely fine. And then leads you into this journey where you find games that you love. Thank you. And, and, and Neil, what's, what's, your, what's your, some of your takeaway? So just give another plug for the work by Fandy and Shanila do it is, is very good uh, from someone who uses both uh, both sets of resources um yeah they're, they're great so they are worth a look uh for me it's that this gaming stuff can be really great can be really positive find out more about it if you can but more importantly talk to your children about it join in and play together wonderful thank you for that thank you we've got a bit of, bit of time left on the the clock and i've scribbled a few questions down um as, as we've been talking um, what about resources for, for kids who come to you and say, uh, who are interested in making games? Are there any kind of tools or sites or, you know, I mean, beyond scratch and those sort of things? What are the, what are the best tools around for, for helping kids just to sort of sandbox and play and make? Maybe, Neil, what, what's, what's your view on that? Oh, <laughs> where, where to start? Um, a lot of it depends on uh, how old they are. And I think for, for younger children, often we have the idea that they have done scratch. And actually, um, what, what can be done and produced in the, the tool is incredible. And if you, you look on, on the community resources there, uh, you'll see a, a wide range of games as sort of scratch versions of Fortnite, for example, uh, that have been produced in um, every game under the sun, uh, pretty much. A lot of it after that will depend on the, the kind of games they perhaps want to uh, produce. Um, if they um, uh, perhaps want to start experimenting with uh, 3D st stuff, uh, perhaps they might look at the, um, the stuff from Unity, for example, um, but it, it might perhaps be that uh, they want to actually get their uh, hand a bit more dirty uh, look at some program with python there's various plugins uh, there where you can very quickly get graphics on the screen um, as well and perhaps passed it over to uh, Shania what kind of resources you recommend perhaps for the uh, the younger teens um, as well so yeah no so um I mean there's there's so much I, I mean there's um on on the development side you, you've uh, got things like construct if you're moving on from um uh, scratch there's things like construct 3 um, which which is great it's 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 a wonderful bridge between uh, block based and sort of text based languages but you'll find that actually um, platforms like unity and unreal will also have um, versions that you can sort of get in and start dabbling with and start learning from in terms of tutorials but there's actually also lots of sandbox games um, that you so if you've got for example uh, dreams on on playstation um, it's a great way to just make and you don't have to step into any coding and it's all quite visual so um you know sometimes i think people if they're not confident they want to make a game but they're not that confident with their programming skills and they think well actually i can't program so i can't make a game and that that's not true and that's you know i think sand these sort of sandbox open world games are great for uh, overcoming things like that so uh, people like dreams but also if you've got the switch there's things like game builder garage there's super mario maker um 
you know, Fortnite Creative is, you know, you're okay, different, but you know, Minecraft, all those types of things. So there's there's lots of ways that you can sort of get creative and and build and and create. But there's also things like Game Maker Tool and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah, the advice is you you know you you can start getting in and dabbling without having to become an expert programmer first. There's lots of tools out there to help you do that. Yeah, I did a, awesome. I did a bit of a test with Game Builder Garage and a bunch of families where we took the game um, into these the families who'd never created a game before. Many of them were quite apprehensive when we started. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go, but I'm sure we won't get anywhere because we're not programmers. Um, and they just have the switch and the game builder garage set up. And you, if they wanted to, they could plug a mouse into the switch, which is which is one of the barriers that integrating the right interface and getting them set up. And I would come back week on week. And actually by even just the second week I was there, all of them had created something that they, that they could play. So some of these kind of, and that's the benefit of these kind of game maker systems is that they get you going and they kind of they don't necessarily teach you tons of programming they'll teach you about logic but it's that yeah. sort of the joy of making and so you leave with oh i can do this oh and i can do it in other ways and then alongside that there's lots of a lot of games will let you create levels so you play a game you like it it's a fully fleshed game fully fledged game um but it also says okay well you can make your own levels and you can share that with the community as well and then the community will feed back and maybe your level becomes popular so it's getting sort of in on that creative um sort of gene really that um you know you suddenly oh we're a family who creates games and, and it kind of redefines who you know who and what you can do so i think there's lots of levels i love the, the other examples i need to go and kind of look into that more like the higher end stuff like unity and scratch and or like beyond scratch. Um, so it, it feels like there's lots of opportunities and sort of sewing those together is, is what I think Digital Schoolhouse do really well at providing a map for like, okay, we've done this, what's next? Which is why I love those resources. Yeah, I know something that is perhaps similar to uh, Mario Maker is uh, Splodder, which has got a arcade game creator built in it. And you, as you put, put the different blocks in, place where your character is going to be, place where your baddies are, and uh, you're away. It's a, a very quick way to get something that's very playable and looks nice quickly. But a lot of children will have experience with using tablets as well and uh, platforms perhaps like App Inventor as well can uh, allow you to produce more complex block-based programming programs mm. that perhaps function similar to a game as well hmm. yeah and what, one last quick example is we i've, I've used uh, Mar um, mario kart home circuit which is this you have a remote control car it's like an ar game but what's nice there is that you create the circuit by driving your car around the house and then the game remembers where you've gone so you do that once and you do quite a simple one and then suddenly you're like oh if i got the car to go up on this table and then down again and underneath and so you get you get a real sense of kind of the level design aspect of play of, of creating a game as well as kind of the coding and i think again there's lots of ways into this and we could probably talk all day about this one topic but it is great to see kids do that and the light bulb go on and be like oh i can make levels oh that's interesting you know then they start thinking that through so that, that there's lots of ways i think that you can engage here fantastic maybe if we can just close out really quickly to talk about the idea of um of, of career pathways i mean how, how can kids find out you know interested in gaming interested in in um creativity but find out about careers beyond maybe just the parts of games that require maths and physics how do, how do kids find out about the career pathways there's um, lots of uh, resources and materials out there. Um, if I if I start by talking about our own, we've got um, uh, One Minute Mentor, which is uh, a short video series um, that's on YouTube. And uh, those are 60 second videos. And there's, I don't know, there's over 100 plus and it's constantly growing uh, library of videos, uh, but essentially different people talking about the things that they do. It's great um, for, um, just giving people a bit of a flavor as to variety and breadth, and then you can dive deeper. There's organizations like Intergames, which are specifically set up around introduction to um, career opportunities within the video games industry. But then you've also got people within industry um, putting putting things out there. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's if you look at Creative Assembly's website, they've got lots of things on there. And then you've got places like Discover Creative Careers, uh, which is which was created by Screen Skills, which is great not just for video games, but actually um, the broader uh, creative digital sector is incorporated within that as well. But yeah, we've got resources and materials. You can start at DSH and and then move other way. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think, guys, I think we've we said we finished by quarter past one, so I think we've 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 achieved that. So, thank you very much. That's been fascinating. Um, thank you, Shanila. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. It's been great. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. Thank you. thank you, guys. See you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.